Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Authentic Sounds. My name is Wim Winters and today, if I'm not wrong, we're making our 25th video recording for the Authentic Sound YouTube channel. And I thought it might be interesting for me and hopefully for you also to explain to you why I chose this title Authentic Sounds which is a title I'm very aware of that that awakens some expectations and to begin with this has nothing to do and I hope that was very clear from the beginning uh, so the, the term Authentic sound has nothing to do with the way I play I have the feeling that certainly for the 18th century but also for the 19th century music and music for before I am not following that as close as I should it's but for that music that we have come in the so-called third generation if I'm not wrong yeah the first generation with uh, Gustav Leonard somewhat later with with Lati uh, Bond, Jos van Nimmersheel, all those great musicians, uh, even my teacher Jacques van Oetmersen, they all did incredible work and started something of which we today can benefit. I mean, it's hard to imagine that when Gustav Leonard started his career as a harpsichord player, that in the 60s this was not at all accepted as being a, a standard of music performance he had to fight to uh, for his stage for being able and being permitted sometimes to play on his harpsichord the same with with Josue Nimmersil I named name two people for which I know the, know the story a little bit but that he has that Van Nimmersil as a as an incredibly gifted pianist. I mean, he ha he could have become easily not easily, but he had the talent and 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 the ability to become a concert pianist. Uh, he took the decision to make the step to the harpsichord at a time where this the world was not ready for it yet. Today it's. It's easy, you, you, you can choose whatever you want to play. So it's this first generation that, that made so many things possible. And what I see today, and I'm speaking in general, is a little bit a kind of taking it for granted that what this first generation did is something we can follow safely and if we stay between these margins that we can with a certain comfort call our way of playing within the framework of this authentic performance practice there is a certain feeling that we've come to a point where everything has been said and everything has everything has been discovered and if i read some articles and I would, would will not go in detail because I would will not would not like to make this video to a kind of um, yeah I would I would I would not like to polarize too much but I do read sometimes that people are putting question marks around this movement of this authentic performance practice that it has reached its top and that we have to look for new ways to um, a kind of sell ourselves and in one way or another it, I feel that it is not true I mean with all due respect to what this first generation did and still does really I mean look what Lapti Bonus still is recording or, or uh, Van Immersil or I, I mean that's, incredible great musicians but I have the feeling that there's still so much that needs to be discovered 
uh, about so many important aspects. It might be so that um, I'm somewhat injected with, with, with this because I had to study as, as an organist in the first place in Amsterdam and as a pianist in the second place. But I, I, I still remember, and this video is getting way too long, but it might be interesting. I still remember the fact that in, in, in the morning I had lessons in, in, in the, in the, at the Müller organ in, in Haarlem and I played a, a trio sonata of Bach in an allegro movement. And in the afternoon I came in the piano class and I had a Mozart sonata to play also in an allegro movement and these tempos, tempi, were so much different. And no way that I could play this this trio sonata faster in on such a large organ as, as the Bavo in Harlem of it, or it was Altmar, uh, the Schmidtke organ, I don't yeah, it was Altmar. But suddenly I remember this moment seeing this difference between two pieces that were written in the same notation, same note value, same note structure, and yet it gave such an that was expected to be played in such a different way. And I, I still remember, I was 23 or 24, can you imagine that I thought, well, Bach died in 1750 and Mozart was born in 1756, six, six years difference. I mean, with, with, with his father, Mozart, Leopold Mozart, as a teacher, there must have been some of the tradition that went from this Baroque era to the Viennese. And I went to do much trouble in the piano class, I can, I can assure you when I asked these questions, because it was not... Uh, uh, and certainly this, this classic piano uh, class, you, it's not the place to, uh, to uh, yeah, become a little bit experimental. Uh, but the same questions in, within the framework of this authentic performance practice are seldom uh, answered why these tempo differences are so big. And I'm convinced that The music as we know it today, I mean within this, again with this framework of authentic performance practice, with, with old instruments, with copy of old instruments, all that, that the way it was performed in the 18th century, I have the feeling that in general we, we, we still need to make a difference. While I was discovering the clavichord as an instrument, which was before 2008, very much unknown to me. And I discovered how important this instrument was in the 18th century. It was a, it was a first keyboard instrument, certainly in the German speaking areas, but it, it traveled along with to, 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 to Vienna, where the pianoforte came, where it was, was much more, became much more important, but, but from the 70s, 80s on. Uh, and if you compare the importance of this instrument, this unfretted five octave clavichord, and only to speak about this in the 18th century and see, look how, man, how much records are made today on this instrument that's disproportional. Only this aspect is something that can, has to put you, make, has to make you think about if we are really working in the depth in this authentic performance practice field. It's, it's, it's an idea, but the clavichord as it sounds, that's an authentic sound. I mean, if I play Mozart on a clavichord, the clavichord was there, Mozart's father sold clavichords that were very much alike as mine. Friedrich clavichord, I mean, it's the same principle. So if I play Mozart on a clavichord, that's, I do not have to explain myself. The instrument was there, Mozart knew the instrument, so if he saw an instrument like mine, he would have played on it. Beethoven, the same thing. That was for me a point of departure. And that's the real explanation of authentic sound. It's the sound in the first place of the clavichord, and in broader sense the philosophy that when you do things and you play on instruments that were available, that there is a kind of basic authenticity in the sense of within this authentic performance practice that goes into that. And again, I'm not saying anything about any person. 
it's just my opinion and maybe I'm wrong but in the future videos and recordings we will I will work in this way and try new things out sometimes it can sound a little controversial if I have the feeling that it might be so I will make an explanation video a vlog about how I come to certain decisions um, please do not hesitate if you have questions if you have remarks um, if you want to have a discussion about this and while you're doing so hit the subscribe button for this channel and we will continue I will continue to make features like this in the future um, regularly okay I will see you next time again and uh, for next videos and music bye